Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Chris Brummer. I'm a professor of law at Georgetown University and a senior fellow at the Center for Financial Markets at the Milken Institute. Uh, today's panel is, uh, appropriately as such, about markets. It's about markets, market infrastructure, and the impact of technology and speed on markets. And it's obviously uh, an issue that is of enormous importance uh, and increasing salience, not only for market participants, uh, and for regulators, but also for the general public. For a discussion of these uh, and other issues, again, relating to markets, market infrastructure, the new market ecosystem that's driving our economy, I'm extremely pleased to have people who have their boots on the ground uh, with these issues every day. Uh, beginning with uh, Seth Marin on my far right, the founder and CEO of LiquidNet Holdings, uh, Jamil Nazarali, the senior managing director of Citadel, uh, Joe Ratterman, the CEO of BATS Global Markets, uh, Fred Tomzik, the president and CEO of TD Ameritrade, and Greg Tussar, the co-head of Global Execution Services and Platforms for KCG. Uh, before we're going to launch into these discussions, uh, we, do, we had agreed that it would be best to provide a bit of context about these issues since they're a bit complex. And uh, given the fact that I'm very used to helping people cram uh, information uh, around this time of year before exams, I'll be carrying the baton uh, to offer a bit of a primer on uh, speed markets and the evolution of our markets. Uh, when one thinks about speed, uh, collectively one generally thinks about two issues, particularly when one looks at your newspapers nowadays. One is high frequency trading. And the other is the proliferation, or some would say fragmentation, of different markets in which these uh, trades are executed. For the uninitiated, high-frequency trading is a kind of computerized trading uh, in which uh, algorithmic uh, trading strategies are used to move in and out of positions, sometimes thousands at a time. And what's really amazing about high-frequency trading isn't just the fact that there's a lot of uh, volume, but it's, it's the speed of these uh, transactions and, indeed, how fast these transactions are executed. Uh, maybe if we could just start with slide five uh, briefly. Uh, simply put, uh, there's been enormous progress, enormous advances in how quickly one can execute trade over the last couple hundred years, uh, moving from the days of the telegraph uh, uh, in which often any trading between far-flung market participants could take, uh, at least prior to that point in time, uh, hours, days, uh, and in the worst of circumstances, months, we've moved progressively uh, along a continuum in which uh, advances in information technology have allowed people uh, to execute uh, trades uh, with ever uh, uh, greater speed. Uh, today, uh, when one looks at uh, the metric used to calculate and to measure the speed of a transaction, we no longer talk uh, about hours, we no longer talk about uh, minutes or even seconds, but instead we talk about milliseconds or one thousandths of a second, something that for many of us, uh, you need a PhD in, 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 in physics really to understand, but I think for, uh, for generalists, it's useful to know that if it takes uh, the blink of an eye to do a transaction, it's taking too long. Uh, alongside uh, these advances with speed, we've also had uh, advances with regard to the ability to process information. That is, we're not only able to execute trades uh, faster, but buy and sell orders can be uh, matched and trading automatized by, uh, based on varying market data with the help of computers. And collectively, speed plus uh, information processing and information tra technology have given rise to high frequency trading. If we look at slide one, the slide that we had begun with, uh, you see uh, really since 2005 an amazing progression in the uh, importance of high frequency trading and the presence of high frequency trading in our markets. Um, it now constitutes over half of all trades. That is, uh, that on the other end of uh, a transaction uh, there's usually some kind of computerized uh, trading system uh, that is associated with uh, the execution uh, and the handling uh, of that order. Uh, it's also used to keep in mind that in addition to the speed issue, to this, this question of high-frequency trading, we've seen uh, the growth of alternative 
uh, markets uh, in which trades can be processed. So when we talk about speed and the evolution of markets, we're not only talking, again, about information technology, but we're also talking about the trading environment in which these trades are executed. Uh, if we look at slide two, we'll see uh, that there has been a growing uh, amount of trades that are no longer executed on the NYC and, and NASDAQ, but instead we're having a proliferation of various venues in which these trades uh, are processed. Uh, there have been different regulations. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the regulation NMS that have allowed uh, exchanges uh, to operate in, in different kinds of ways uh, uh, and have provided the, the groundwork really for institutional uh, players to establish their own platforms for executing their customers' orders. Uh, and so we see that today uh, off exchange trading has increased dramatically along with obviously uh, uh, the speed with which transactions can be executed. In short, the combination of speed and a more complex trading environment have led to uh, uh, various phenomena, or at least uh, uh, various sort of upsides and downsides, at least according to many experts. Uh, for the positive, uh, people have identified, if one looks at slides three and four, uh, a reduction in the price of trading. Um, at least when one looks at uh, the bid-ask spreads for trades, they fall into historic lows. And as a result, uh, there is at least a correlation uh, that seems to indicate that just as uh, high frequency trading has arisen and as people have been able to execute trades uh, a bit faster, uh, we certainly have noticed uh, that there have been some gains uh, for investors. On the other hand, as many of you know, there have been uh, uh, an increasing amount of criticism about both speed and the environment in which these trades are, are executed. Um, in short, uh, perhaps popularized, as many of us know, uh, from, from Michael Lewis uh, recently, uh, there are concerns that the market uh, may be rigged insofar as faster trades allow some market participants to weave in and out and between some of these different markets uh, that we've seen, uh, that this proliferation of markets has allowed uh, uh, the savvy, uh, uh, resource-rich investors to uh, benefit uh, at the expense of the small guy. And then certain economists have questioned whether or not speed itself is a public good, that uh, whether or not speed itself is something that's really benefited uh, investors or not, uh, a question that's been recently uh, raised by uh, uh, the economist uh, uh, and Nobel Prize winning economist Stiglitz. Uh, this obviously presents a number of questions. So uh, with that basic background, I think I want to move directly uh, to take on that issue uh, headfirst, at least for the retail investor. And I think really uh, there's, there's no better place uh, to ask about retail investors you know, uh, than uh, to ask about uh, Ameritrade and to ask about uh, how retail investors are faring in this new environment where speed is so important uh, and where the environment is increasingly uh, complex. Yeah, so from, from our per uh, perspective, uh, largely a retail firm, we would say the retail investor today uh, has it better off than they've ever had it in history. If you look at a number of statistics, you look at the average commission per trade, it's gone from 10 years ago, $52 in our space to uh, roughly $12, so about an 80% drop. If you look at bid-ask spreads on most traded securities, uh, they used to be in 16ths and in 8ths, you know, say 6 to 12 cents. And today they're trading on average at 2 cents. I think on most actively traded stocks, they're trading at a penny. So, you know, so on those two metrics, they've done very, very well. The second, the other part of this all is that their execution speed <laughs> has been uh, remarkably has gone from about 10 seconds in our industry to execute a trade 10 years ago to today. We even have people advertising in our space that your trade will get executed in a second or less or we'll give you the commission free. And, and on top of all that, there's, a, there's good robust liquidity, uh, whether, regardless of how you measure it, whether it's shares or volume, liquidity is at higher levels. So I think in all of our experience, the retail investor has never had it better. Uh, trading costs are lower, bid-ask spreads are lower, execution time is lower. Uh, and just to put a perspective on this, there's a lot of noise around Michael Lewis's book. Um, you know, we have 6.1 million customers. Uh, we've had less than, we've had 70 phone calls and 120 emails since that book went out with all the emotion. And so 
from our perspective, this has become, this is much more of a Wall Street issue than it is a, a Main Street issue with a retail investor. And, and can I just follow up very briefly with the question on commissions? Is, is that uh, fall in the, in the price of commissions, in your view, driven uh, 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 by, by the speed or by uh, more competition in the market with the trading venues? What exactly is, is, is pushing uh, the pressure on? Well, I think it, all the improvements in the market and then the reduction in commissions is really, I think, regulation. Has, we've had smart regulation, which has changed the bid ask spreads, decimalization, the electronification of the markets, a competitive market structure have all driven increased competition and a push. Uh, when you marry that up with what's happened with technology uh, and data and analytics, you've had a significant change in our industry and in the market structure. It's much more competitive. Uh, it is about scale uh, and it is about driving down your unit costs and, and increasing the volume through. So people are doing that essentially on price of one way, shape or form and execution. And um, so it's been driven by, you know, I think regulation, but by technology, uh, which we would include big data, you know, big data and analytics, but we'd also include high frequency trading in that, in that venue. Interesting, interesting. Uh, yeah, obviously, when one talks, again, about this new environment, uh, the question about uh, trading platforms and proliferation of trading platforms uh, becomes uh, uh, very important. And BATS has been uh, obviously uh, a big player in the uh, 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 proliferation and increase of, 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 of different kinds of formats, different places for trading. Um, we've heard a bit about the retail investors, but how have institutional investors fared and how would you compare and how do you view the relationship between institutional investors, particularly from BATS' perspective, institutional investors and the retail investors? Uh, so first of all, uh, I, I want to uh, confirm what, uh, what Fred is saying, that it, you know, the, the, the uh, experience for the retail investor has, has really improved over, over many years. I'm a, I'm a retail investor myself and you know, I, I, I can confirm you know, sub-second executions and you know, paying more than $10 for a commission is just not you know, something I would even think about doing. And I've watched uh, from uh, the early 2000s till today, that environment changed dramatically for the better. Um, so for the institutional trader, and Seth is going to weigh in here uh, in a little bit, um, you know, the exchange is not necessarily a place for the institution to do large size. Um, so when you look at the exchanges, the, uh, the average execution size has you know, fallen down to 200 shares uh, to 250, something like that, uh, you know, over, over time. And, and so institutions are finding that they have to invest in a lot of the same technology that the, the market makers are, are having to invest in just to access the markets and divide up their shares and, and find, find, some place, you know, find the different uh, venues to execute. Um, to put some numbers on it, there's, uh, as of today, 13 displayed exchanges run by five exchange operators. Uh, we run four of those exchange uh, pools of liquidity. NYSE runs three, NASDAQ runs three. Uh, Chicago, runs, Chicago Board Options Exchange runs two, one of which is folding up uh, at, the end of this, at the end of this week, actually. Uh, so there'll be 12 exchange books by the end of, uh, by the end of this month. Um, the, and there's been some consolidation. So you see one of these books going away with our acquisition of Direct Edge. Uh, we've gone from two operators to one. So there is some consolidation happening in this space. Um, some other things I want to put on the table just to help understand um, you know, where the institutions would look at this market. Uh, you talked about 51% uh, on that last chart. I think that was from TAB, which was uh, high frequency uh, trading. So. It's, it's hard to talk about that as a single number, so just to put some, uh, put some uh, feel to it uh, at BATS, and I believe this is indicative of NYSE and NASDAQ as well, I would say about 31% of the volume on our market is, is, uh, by, is done by market makers. Uh, and I've, I've kind of stopped using the word automated market makers because really market makers are of one flavor today. Um, and then about 30% uh, of the volume on, on the exchange is also from bulge bracket firms from the JP Morgan's, uh, Goldman Sachs, Citadel, uh, not Citadel, uh, and so forth. About 15% is from uh, niche or second tier broker dealers uh, bringing institutions into the market. And only about 10% really is proprietary trading. And so, uh, and then uh, on, on those trades that happen in the market, there's two sides of the trade, so you have to look at both sides of that trade. And so the picture I think I'd like to leave behind here is that about a third of the market 
um, is made up of a directional trader matching up with a, a market maker, and then the rest is naturals finding each other. And there's just not a lot of naturals finding each other, which is why you have such a demand for, uh, for market making. So, um, you know, market maker, or sorry, uh, institutions are, uh, are having to go through a, a series of different exchanges and dark pools to get their trades done. Uh, I certainly commend Seth and LiquidNet as well as uh, you know, ITG's Posit is the other place where large institutional trades are happening today. I think the average trade size on your market is 30,000 shares or something like that. Over 40. Over 40,000 shares. You know, that's, that's something that you just cannot do on, a, on an exchange. And so you know, our job as an exchange is uh, you know, some of the primary price formation that a lot of the, uh, the activity that follows on then on for, in uh, areas like uh, LiquidNet. Uh, would take place. Can I just ask one, one basic question and, and then I'll have uh, obviously Seth respond to his views. How do, how do you view the, the role of the market media, uh, intermediary in, in this environment where you have high speed frequency trading and where you do have a much more fragmented marketplace? Uh, you know, has the role of the exchange uh, changed in your view uh, uh, mm -hmm. from a functional standpoint? Actually, no. I think the, the role of the exchange has been pretty much the same, you know, certainly since we've been running our markets. You know, our job is price formation. You know, we're not necessarily in the primary business of, of, of capital formation. You know, that's through the IPO process. Um, we do have uh, ETF listings on our market. Uh, NYSE and NASDAQ have the bulk of the, uh, of the listings. So they're, they're part of the, of the capital formation process. But uh, once, a, once a stock has started trading, then it's, it's about secondary trading and, and, and price formation. And that, that is our, our role, and our role is to make you know, make it easy for any constituency to come to the market. You know, we, we're responsible for running a fair, and a fair access, open, transparent uh, venue where anybody can come and is treated the same. So that, that's our primary job uh, in the marketplace. Okay. Well, Seth, Joe and Fred have painted a pretty optimistic uh, uh, picture uh, of the market uh, and in terms of both the operation of the market, uh, the, the beneficiaries of these developments in the market, both the growing uh, 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 sort of set of options, but also complexity and fragmentation of the markets, but also the technological innovations that we see uh, inhabiting uh, the market. Uh, what is uh, your view? I mean, certainly uh, uh, both your uh, liquid net and, and, and uh, other companies are engaging these issues in innovative ways? Well, <clears throat> let me paint the picture of our customers, right? So uh, LiquidNet is a network of about 750 of the largest asset managers around the world, and they all connect into a, a community, and they share the liquidity to trade. Our average <clears throat> customer manages about 20 billion, a little less than $20 billion of equities under management. <clears throat> if you figure that uh, portfolio manager, um, the way that they think is that they like a stock and they want it to be a one, two, three, five percent position of their portfolio. And if, uh, if you take the $20 billion and you say, okay, I want a one percent position, that means that they have to buy $200 million worth of stock. If it's $200 million worth of stock, and let's say that the average price is $20, they have to buy 10 million shares. The average execution size on the floor is less than 250 shares. That's the problem, right? So, this industry is so highly inefficient for lots of reasons, but you know, you think about any other industry, and, and <clears throat> quite frankly, the, the asset management industry is fairly young. 30 years ago, um, you know, uh, Fidelity managed only a few billion dollars. Now you have funds that manage over trillions of dollars. Um, so, you know, the, the, the assets under management have grown 40 times in the last 30 years. You would think that there would be a wholesale market that would have popped up to handle the wholesale buyers and sellers. Well, it hasn't. Um, and you know, just because of that inefficiency, and it's simple, you know, um, anybody taking economics? <laughs> right? OK, so let's say that the average, execute, the average order size of, of a, an institution is a million shares, and the average execution size on the floor is 200 shares. What happens? The economic term is you're screwed, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, that's, that's the problem that we face. So whether there's high frequency trading, I mean, and this occurred long before high frequency trading came around, it's simply a, su a supply demand imbalance. And there, there are two reasons why the, the stock moves against the institution. One is the supply demand imbalance, which 
there's no way, if you slice it down into little tiny orders, you cannot fool the market into thinking that there's no supply-demand imbalance, right? You still need to buy a million shares, and they're still offering 200 shares. The other is simply information leakage. And in the bad old days, um, you, you know, an institution would call up the broker and say, buy me a million shares of X, Y, and Z. And the level of technology on the desk, would they get on the loudspeaker and say, I'm a million share buyer of X, Y, and Z? And that would trigger all of the salespeople to get on the phones and start ringing all their customers. Now, if every one of their customers and every one of their brokers were absolutely scrupulous, then fine. But, you know, sometimes um, somebody on the other end of the phone does not have the other side or did not have the other side, and they know what a supply demand imbalance does in the market, and they started buying up ahead of that institution. Now, that is illegal. Um, but, and that's the bad old days. Um, so today, you, I think you have less of that because more of the, the trading is, is done electronically, but there's still information leakage. And I just want to, you know, I've been on record saying not all high-frequency trading is bad, um, and not all high-frequency trading is good. A lot of high-frequency trading actually creates uh, market efficiencies, without question. Uh, but there's some high-frequency trading that simply takes advantage of that um, supply-demand imbalance. And ultimately, what it, you know, what it means is that a, a very small amount of people make a lot of money at the expense of very many. And all those people that invest with the mutual funds and the pension funds. So, you know, there's one market and everyone, you know, not everyone plays nicely and there, there are very different constituents out there. Um, but that's the reason why LiquidNet exists. We're not a 100% solution, but in the case where you can match up size with size and eliminate that supply, demand, and balance and eliminate the leakage that goes with that, then you know, it saves a, a tremendous amount of money and actually it goes into the returns of all of us who invest our money with those mutual funds and the pension funds. I think Seth made a couple points which I'd like to touch on. One was uh, he referred to the bad old days, which, which I agree with. Uh, today's trading is so much more efficient than it ever has been. Uh, I think Vanguard, which is, as you know, one of the largest institutional money managers uh, in the world, in a letter to the SEC, their chief information officer was talking about the benefits of automation to the marketplace. And by Vanguard's uh, estimates, uh, automated trading has reduced the cost of, uh, of getting in and out of these million share trades by 50 basis points. Now that's hard for an everyday person to understand what's 50 basis points. So Vanguard took it uh, a step further and they calculated that if an ordinary investor was investing $10,000 and they're investing it for the retirement, at the end of 30 years, because of that 50 basis point reduction in transaction costs, they would have an additional $32,000 a year. So those, those are the kind of benefits this automated trading has brought to the marketplace. And I think that anyone who invests in today's market is a, is a big beneficiary of that. Well, it's, it's certainly not only, uh, and, and we'll get into other, other sources of potential inefficiencies, uh, or at least potential sources of, in some would argue, unfairness, uh, in the sense of uh, uh, some folks having uh, co-located facilities and getting uh, uh, speed advantages over, over others. Uh, but I did want to uh, uh, at least have the opportunity to ask uh, the question about speed uh, to our last uh, very important uh, guest for today, uh, which is uh, Greg uh, Tussar. Uh, the market inefficiencies that, that Seth is, is, is identifying, the fact that inevitably there are there seem to be some kinds of uh, market, or excuse me, informational leakages that create opportunities for what some would describe to be a modern uh, version of, of front running. Others would just certainly say, well, it, it enables a, a form of, of faster momentum trading that leads to greater volatility in markets. I mean, what, is, what is your view toward, uh, towards these, these market um, uh, features and, and this discussion as to, as to market efficiency? Because it, it appears to me, and from many in the audience, that what, you're, uh, what you do see are, are, are some folks who have the ability to move faster than others, gleam certain forms of information uh, that uh, allow them to execute faster trades, and uh, you know, it, it creates certain kinds of advantages, uh, perhaps, over the long run, uh, but certainly in the short run, the millisecond run, uh, it, it does seem to uh, create some imbalances that, that, that lots of people are not entirely comfortable with. Right. 
So I think a couple things before, before addressing the difficulty for institutional traders, which I think no, in, without a doubt has gone up a lot in a world that's been geared much more towards the small order than the large order. Um, I, I just want to address the issue of speed, which is sort of central to the panel, to the discussion. And you know, I think it's important to recognize that speed isn't and shouldn't be the objective. I think competition as sort of a first guiding principle uh, as well as choice really should be the two things that help us decide whether we're heading in the right direction from a market structure perspective or not. Um, I think that speed is a second order consequence of competition and of having market makers who are competing to set the best price to be in the right venues and at the right times to interact with order flow. And I think whether it's institutions or retail orders, that competition benefits in the way Jamil described of lower transaction costs ultimately. But there's no question that in a world of smaller displayed sizes that um, you really, really need good technology to make sure if you don't find a natural in a system like Seth's that you're trading in a way that doesn't leave a footprint in the market. Because the other consequence of having world as fast as we have is that it, it prices in all of the information almost essentially in real time. So the things that used to happen in days or weeks, in other words, I would run a model and look at how stock A is mispriced relative to stock B, then you know, do, owing to Moore, Moore's law and everything that's happened from a computing power perspective, I could run that every day, then I could run it every hour. Now it literally is every tick, whether it's of futures or all related stocks, prices information into the market effectively in real time. And I think that's a real challenge for the institutional investor um, to enter and exit the market without, um, without leaving a footprint. I would submit that the, you know, the answer to that is, is rest with technology, using technology that looks for naturals to the greatest degree possible, um, looks to interact with intermediaries and market makers, but does it in a way that um, intelligently shows size to minimize that issue. I think that given what Vanguard and some others um, in some recently published op-eds have shown, it is possible, and I think it has led to lower transaction costs. Can I just say that um, Vanguard is one of very, very few buy-side firms who talks about actually reducing the overall cost. And we all know that, you know, measuring this thing. How absurd is it that there's an entire industry that's devoted to measuring how much it costs the institutions every time they trade? Not how to fix it, just how much it costs. Clearly, there's a problem there, right? So there's Vanguard on the one hand, and then there are all these different surveys. The most recent one came out that 70% of the buy side you know, um, is very, very wary of high frequency trading, and that's to put it very politely. Um, so you know, I, I think that there's the, the majority of, the, of our customers um, are not happy about it. Not that it, they're doing anything illegal or doing anything immoral. I think that it just comes out of the overall return um, and, and it just forces the prices higher or lower. Is, is there a fairness issue that you seem to, I mean, it, it's hard obviously to talk about fairness uh, uh, when you're talking about large institutional investors, but to the extent to which you're dealing with a pension fund or you know, who's, who's trying to unload a, a large order, uh, and they may not necessarily have the technological wherewithal to be able to compete with uh, other nimbler traders. Have you seen in your experience some uh, you know, concern beyond just, uh, you know, certainly when beyond just execution price, uh, but just a concern that they're just not matched uh, with the other players and therefore they need a safer environment? Um, there is absolutely an arms race that goes on, right? So that, um, you know, it's, it's electronics, um, the algorithms against algorithms. So, you know, everyone's trying to find an algorithm that can outsmart the, the HFT um, or the other predatory players out there. And the predatory players are the ones that have a lot of money and, and uh, are, are specifically focused on um, outsmarting the algorithms that the buy side have. So, you know, it's really, it's not, um, and, and so, 
our customers and, and the asset managers, they're all big boys and big girls, right? They're not the ones that you have to protect. It's up to them to protect their information. We're not talking about retail here, which clearly, and I agree, um, has not been disadvantaged. So there are venues for these big guys to go to. It's not a 100% uh, solution, um, but there are uh, ways that they can um, try to avoid at least some of the impact um, that they occur, that they incur. But it's, it's, it's a technology, it's a technological race at this point that the institutions, the buy side, I think, will always lose. This is a market structure problem that has to be solved. So if I have to disagree with your characterization of this race between the predatory uh, automated traders and the institutions, because I think that really what's happened is that what had been done historically in a very manual way on the floor of New York Stock Exchange, there's thousands of traders. At each of the large banks, there are thousands of traders. That provision of liquidity, that intermediation, is now done by computers. And as a result, every investor gets their trade done better, faster, cheaper. I understand every, every that. Every investor? I'm sorry? Every investor? You can't make any statement about every single investor, but yes, investors are better off. Um, and, and Every academic study that's looked at transaction costs, including some by the industry, ITG, has shown that it's not just uh, Vanguard. Institutional investors are much better off in today's world than they've ever been. And I realize that you, know that there, that there you will so sell more of your product there. if you convince people that... No, no, uh, no. Clearly, we're a much better venue for institutions to be able to execute on, right? I mean, our, our stats are, are off the charts compared to you know, being able to buy 200 shares at a shot. I don't think that that's subject to debate, right? But I do think that it's always been a market structure problem. This is not a new problem, that's, right? That's and you know, I'm not saying, I'm not say, I'm not saying that um, uh, the, the uh, automation has not benefited many. It hasn't fixed the problem though, right? The that's, problem that existed before exists today for the institutions, right? Um, it's clearly better off for the, for the, um, for the retail players. But clearly, the institutions still have the same problem that they had. And in fact, it's probably more, ex it's, it's further exacerbated it's simply because their assets have grown. So I'd like to jump in just a little bit here. Sure. Um, so, uh, it, and with Jamil, uh, it's not just uh, Vanguard. Uh, BlackRock put out a, a, a wonderful piece on market structure where BlackRock, I think, is the world's largest asset manager, came out and said that they've never had it any better, uh, that there could be improvement, but that the, the same, the same, uh, statements are being made that commissions and uh, spreads have come down, and so there's there's multiple out there, and you know arguably there's there's going to be many on both sides for a while, but uh, it's not just isolated to uh, to Vanguard. Um, so one one thing that I think that's uh, helpful to understand um, about uh, about speed is that we talked about this earlier, and automation is that. Um, the, uh, the, the, the market making process um, has changed, um, but it's still the intermediary uh, who needs to be there when the two buy side guys can't find each other. The way I kind of like to visualize it is, you know, you got smart buy side guys that have got large positions to trade, and they're like ships going down the channel the same direction. And unless they run into each other, then there's not a trade to be had. And that's where market making is vital in today's markets, that you have to have someone to cover that time gap between when one really smart guy wants to buy and one really smart guy wants to sell, because frequently they're on the same side of the trade, which is why you know, venues like LiquidNet are important, but it's not the vast majority of the volume every day. That only happens so often that these guys are on opposite sides of the trade. And so Correct. you need it's not, different even, it's not even the vast majority of stocks. Right? right when the ECNs came out for NASDAQ, they, they were fine matching the top 300 names. Mm -hmm. right? But what about the other 4,000 names? Yeah. And you need market makers. To have an efficient market, mm -hmm. you know, one of the big problems with the uh, specialists on the New York Stock Exchange, why did you have to have an intermediary to sit in the middle of crossing AT&T and IBM? That's absurd. Those are the liquid stocks that can cross among mm -hmm. themselves. But to have a, an efficient market, you need venues that can uh, execute between themselves without an intermediary. But you clearly need market making. You clearly need facilitation for the vast majority of stocks. Yeah. And, and clearly you needed that specialist function, it appeared to me, when times were not necessarily good. That, that is, in times of either uh, stress, right? I mean, certainly when you're operating on a traditional exchange, the specialists would be around when uh, liquidity otherwise would, would, would dry up. And we don't necessarily have that same, sorry? 
Uh, we don't necessarily <laughs> That's have a dream. It's a, it's, 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 you know, you but, don't but, make money being on the wrong side of the market, right? You, so, no, absolutely. Yeah. But the question is to the degree to which a specialist had information about what was coming down the pike, whether or not that additional bit of information uh, uh, warranted or, mer or, or would at least yeah. outweigh the cost of being there when there were no other takers on, 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 uh, on, on, the, on the buy or, or on, on the bid ask. And so, I think that one of the questions that I would, when I, I, I think I have for, 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 for BATS and I think for really many of the participants on the stage is whether or not uh, it's not only a question of market infrastructure that's changing, but really the expectations that we have of our market intermediaries and our uh, uh, market professionals. That is, to the degree to which the provision of liquidity may be fine in, you know, in, in a in an environment in which we're either operating with heavily traded stocks or in which we're operating in a market that's, that's frothy or robust, uh, you know, when things get a little scary um, uh, and the high frequency traders, um, uh, because of their programming, may not necessarily be there at the same um, uh, level uh, as in other uh, normal times, whether or not there should be other uh, either market venues or rules or um, innovations uh, uh, in the market to provide a bit more uh, stability uh, from a market infrastructure standpoint. So certainly that's, that's uh, a question that you get not just with the flash crash kind of event, but really what happens when uh, it's not so much greed that drives the market, but fear. Yeah. Um, and I, I, was, I was wondering, since BATS is now on exchange, mm -hmm. whether or not it, it views its, its role as, as having changed uh, uh, given those potential risks. Yep, so I'm gonna link to something you said and something that Seth that said together because I'm pretty excited about some of the developments in the last few years that have addressed this very issue about stability, especially in times of uh, fear or when the market's uh, falling. Uh, Seth is right. There's never been a situation ever where a market-making firm or a specialist was willing to stand in front of the moving freight train <laughs> when it was going down. Um, no one's going to go out of business for the betterment of the market. Um, and, and so uh, what we've developed since the flash crash is pretty exciting. You combine market maker obligations, which we've, we, which we've brought in just a little bit. And so market makers now need to be within 8% of the inside, need to be, uh, you know, have a two-sided market up. And you combine that with this new functionality that, uh, that we've rolled out over the last couple of years in the industry called Limit Up, Limit Down. You now have a structural way in which the market stops trading in times of stress so that uh, people can take a collective breath, go back and look at their screens, look at their data feeds, and decide where a stock really needs to be trading instead of you know, letting it continue to fall in a continuous fashion and hoping that somebody holds it up. That has never happened. It's, uh, it's never going to happen. And so this combination of having market makers who are there trading most of the time um, and then a structure called you know, limit up, limit down, circuit breakers that, uh, that stop the market when it's going too far too fast. Everybody can take a breath, come back, open the, up and up the stock where it's supposed to be trading, and no one has to go out of business uh, to support that stock. And so pretty excited that this has been rolled out in the last few years. And uh, you know, I would say that that was probably one of the biggest holes that the industry saw with the flash crash, and that's been completely plugged. Excellent. I think the, to, a, to many degrees, the notion of specialist or market maker or designated market maker has become uh, a bit of a vestige of the past and hasn't really kept up with modern market structure. We have the notion of market, make, market maker at each one of the displayed venues. Um, a, a lot of the obligations don't extend across venues. I think one of the things that um, we should discuss and debate as an industry is it seems like we're going to go through a holistic review is what the benefits and what the obligations should be for a market maker because I think that's an important principle. There are many things, as were said before, about the floor of the New York Stock Exchange that as sort of a closed system and a lot of informational asymmetry and things that I think are far better off, but I think the, the principles of market making and reestablishing them so that people understand what quote unquote HFT is and we have a definition of market maker that is systemic would be a, a, a good step forward. I, Fred, I, I want to get back um, to this question of, of, uh, of the retail investor, of, of the small guy. You know, one of the interesting things I seem to hear both from um, uh, Seth who's, who's 
obviously taking, uh, being a little bit more circumspect about the advantages and disadvantages of, of high frequency trading, and obviously from the other panelists, is that, uh, as you've said, uh, it, it appears, uh, at least in the panel, that, that retail investors um, are benefiting from this technological, um, from these technological advances. However, there is a, a concern uh, with retail uh, investors, particularly after the financial crisis. But you know, uh, certainly now there's a sense that they don't have the same ability to profit uh, and to earn the same revenues as perhaps more advanced players in the market. From your perspective, from the retail end, what do you think could be done uh, to help to allay these concerns of market confidence. Obviously, uh, uh, Ameritrade is doing well now, but it, it's, it's a longer systemic question as to uh, the participation that uh, Americans have in their financial markets when there's a sense somehow that they're not being able to operate on a, on a level playing field. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I'll make a couple comments. First off, the average retail investor, when they put in a trade, uh, if it's a market order, they just they see a price that's quoted. Did I get it or did I not? Or did I get better? And how quickly? That's their view of the world. And so that basically, if I saw twenty dollars and two cents, and I got twenty dollars and two cents in under a second, I'm a happy camper. If it's a limit order, you basically specify the price you want. Did I get that price or did I get better? And how how long did it take to to fill that? So I think. Uh, and in some respects, I, when I, when I hear that people are arguing about, you know, is the, the reality is, is the markets have been retailized. And I understand the issue that that creates for some big buyers and sellers, but, you know, in a selfish perspective, I, you know, we'll always say, well, let's retailize everything because at the end of the day, that's the best thing for the retail investor. I do think where you have confidence issues, and it's, it's not caused by Michael Lewis's book, um, I think, um, what you is the events that you have, whether it's uh, an IPO that goes bad, and you know, to uh, some of the market makers on there for like our clients that day when the Facebook IPO went down, they stepped in and made them whole. That that's that's you know we thank those market makers because that you know they were there, they made our clients whole on a tough day, and I think what we, and I think what uh, what Joe was talking about with you know limit up, limit down and the tighten market maker responsibilities should take away a lot of these events because when a retail investor gets worried about they really don't understand how the market works but when you have an event that destroys confidence uh, that's when they get upset. So if I could just chime in there, right? Um, I, I think that w what would add to market confidence is for our regulators, and I, I'm going to agree with Greg, to be a little bit proactive right and, and thinking about any any business if they if they're doing the business right they're going to think about okay uh, what's the environment today what's the macro what's the micro and and let's think about the top 10 risk lists what could happen that could go wrong and let's come up with some mitigation plans right okay. so you know when when um uh, uh, we, we knew about electronic trading a long time ago. We knew and we should have known that, you know, even with fat finger things, you know, we could shoot uh, the market up or down for, for no reason whatsoever. Yet it took the crash and then multiple years afterwards for the regulators to say limit up, limit down, right? How absurd is that? If we could anticipate some of these things um, ahead of time and let, you know, uh, the SEC um, is in the, the largest financial center of the world, right? Washington, D.C., for some reason. Um, you know, when's the last time they, they came and, and visited you guys mm. to ask your opinion of what could go wrong or to bring you into a meeting to, to discuss, you know, let's, let's have some industry experts in a room to discuss this. So, you know, the, the fact that the, the regulators, and I could go off years on this, but you know, the regulators, um, they, you know, they, they sit down with the regulations and they're a bunch of lawyers and they're looking at it as if it were the Constitution of the United States, interpreting it to see whether something is good or bad. And these regulations were written before computers were around, yeah. right? So, you know, there are structural problems with, with the way that we're being regulated. And I think that there are some simple issues that could help restore and perhaps maintain investor yes. confidence is so critical. I would add to that. I mean, because I, I, I agree with that, you know, but it, it's getting everybody to agree on what those issues are, but then also what's the solution. Yeah. And no, too often people go to the SEC or to Washington 
and basically come in with a solution looking for a problem to solve. It is somebody. It, because that's I, what the SEC is set up for. You go in and you ask for what you need and they look at you circumspect, right? Because it's just one person. They don't invite the conversation. You know, talking, just going to you, Greg, and, and you know, you think about um, some, I can give you an easy one that I think everyone can agree on, right? So the markets today, globally, are so interconnected, right? Theoretically, you could have a, an index on Abu Dhabi that's based off of our S&P 500 right now. Somebody does something wrong in Abu Dhabi and our market crashes. Mm -hmm. That is something that is a risk that people should be thinking about and trying to figure out how to solve today, not after the fact. I think that that's just one example of Agree, and, and I think just to go back to Fred's point, we have to agree on first, if we're gonna have a holistic review, what are first principles for that holistic review? Are we solving for displayed liquidity? We're solving for spread? We're solving for a number of things because I do think there are a number of specific solutions that, that address specific problems, but we really need to take a step back and look at the whole, the whole thing. I think the other thing, having mentioned a few firms, what they have in common is a very quantitatively driven investment process, which lends itself to measurement. And I think one very positive development at the SEC has been the, you know, the, the MIDAS system, as it's called, and the data that it now produces should lead us towards a more data-driven approach to regulation. And I think asking ourselves, what does the data suggest we should do, is, a, I think, an extraordinarily positive development because we talk a lot about things like predatory strategies and things, all of which manifests in the data and we should be able to answer these questions. Um, I, I, you know, I think that's something that regulators in the industry need to continue to invest in. I'd like to add in there that uh, I'm very optimistic right now with the current commission and the staff at the SEC. So my system that, uh, that Greg talks about is uh, really the, the, the spokesperson there is Greg Berman. He's out talking a lot. You can read a speech that he just gave a couple weeks ago where he's you know, talking about complexity and speed from a data-centric perspective. Um, you know, Mary Jo White has just hired a head of TNM, which has been vacant for the better part of a year. Steve Luparello, so now they've got the staff in place. You've got uh, a strong commission from my perspective, and you've got a chairman, a chairwoman, Mary Jo White, who has gone on record with Bloomberg saying, you know, we're going to stop, we're gonna walk our way through, we're gonna look at everything, everything's on the table, and we start from a perspective that the markets aren't rigged, and we need more statements like that from the regulator, where they go in and they look at something, and then they, they declare, we've looked, it's fine, we're moving on, or we've looked and there needs to be improvement. And I think that's going to restore a lot of confidence is when you hear a regulator, to set this point, saying out loud what they've seen, what they've looked at, and what they're going to do. And, uh, and you know, it has been kind of quiet for, uh, for the last few years. Um, but I think we've got a very strong commission right now, and you've got a good staff at TNM that can carry us through this. Well, cer certainly, as, as a Washingtonian who works across the street uh, from the SEC, one of the things that you, you notice is that, you know, in a world in which markets move in microseconds, you know, regulators are not uh, institutionally uh, always uh, able to respond uh, in, at a speed that, that matches the needs of the market, in part because of the, the complexity. And so regulators obviously aren't going to be able to do everything by themselves. And uh, Jamil, I, I want to ask you, from your own perspective, well, what do you think that the market itself could do, perhaps, to help to bolster uh, uh, confidence and to make uh, improvements in, in, in the perception of how uh, these developments in market infrastructure are impacting the, the efficiency uh, of, of, of trading? So I think I think probably the most important thing that the uh, that that the market can do is to stop the uh, food fight where everyone is pointing fingers at everyone else. Um, I think that we all agree that uh, that the market that that there are still uh, improvements that can be made, but that uh, things are much better than they were ten or fifteen years ago. I wouldn't. Uh, I go think back. I wouldn't go back. Uh, yes, exactly. So I think we all agree with that. I think we all agree retail investors uh, as a whole are much better served than they've ever been before. And I think the, the, the one interesting thing about U.S. capital markets is it's one of the few markets in the world where the little guy actually gets a better deal than the big guy. You know, if I'm buying a million bottles of Coke or if I'm buying, you know, a ton of steel or, or if I'm buying anything in bulk, 
Uh, I typically am going to get a much better price than if I'm buying a small lot. Uh, in U.S. capital markets, the little guy who's buying 100 shares can actually transact at better prices. Are you saying that as a positive? Just a fact. I I'm saying that as it a fact. It is a fact, but that is an inverse market, right? You know that that's screwed up. Remember that the institution is managing money on, all the, uh, on behalf of all these little people. So you can't simply say that the guy who, who goes to TD Ameritrade to buy 100 shares of something um, is, the, is, is advantaged. You know that if you are going to buy in bulk, um, you should be getting a overall better price than that who's buying retail. And in fact, you know, in, in the ideal world, you know, when, when a retail guy goes to buy something on TD Ameritrade and gets the price that they see on the screen, that's an example of an, of an efficient market. That's what we should strive for, right? So that when an institution wants to buy a million shares, theoretically, they should be able to buy a million shares at the same price that they see. Um, of course, that's, that's a pipe dream, right? But to say that, that that institution, again, managing money on behalf of all of us, who has to buy a million shares, 200 shares at a shot, one penny up, that's just an absurd but, but situation. Sorry, please. No, no, I mean, I guess I, my, my own pushback as a competitive market structure and there's a lot of innovation going on. If that's an issue, then why can't, you know, the big houses come up with a creative solution? And I think they have. I think your platform is there. It's a creative, innovative solution. I think, I think uh, uh, there's been a number of algo providers. I think that's the right question, though. And it's never going to be perfect. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that have created solutions. So, you know, we, we talked about the issue of fairness. Is it fair that uh, some people have co-located computers within the stock exchanges? It is fair because uh, anyone can get the benefit of that by paying fractions of a cent to their algo uh, uh, provider. You know, you don't have to go there and put your own computers there. What about you the can spread networks that will only sell their line to people who can pay, what is it, $20 million a month? Um, no, let me put a fine point on this. Uh, from, from looking at the, the dashboard I have as an exchange operator, 97% of the volume done on my exchange, and I assume the same to be true for NASDAQ and NYSE, is done by people who have taken our direct data feeds and put servers next to the exchange. And so all broker-dealers are accessing the exchanges the same way. It is fair, and it's not just fair, it's actually being used that way. There, there's hardly any participant that comes into the markets today that doesn't use co-location and direct feeds to transact with the exchanges. So whether you're an institution coming in indirectly through a broker. That doesn't really answer the question, Joe, right? I mean, there are folks that have the wherewithal to pay for that extra, you know, decrement of lessening, lessening the millisecond. It, it's that, it's I, the entire market. That's my, that's my point, is that 97% of the volume that's done on exchange is done by people who have those same tools. So the whole market has come forward. It's not just a few elect people uh, that take those. That take and, and that speed enables, enables uh, liquidity providers to quote better prices because they can manage their risk better. So quotes have narrowed. And as a result, trading costs have gone down. That's, that's, that's interesting because obviously Joe Stiglitz uh, has questioned, you know, uh, where does it all end? And this is actually getting back to, to this question of an arms race, right? You know, uh, yeah, well, what, is, what is the value of speed? After you, you, you move past a certain, um, you know, once you start to move towards the speed of light, uh, you know, is there additional social value uh, that's being offered? I think that's, we, yeah, so we, I, I we think take away from that debate, quite frankly, and, and let's go back to what is the purpose of a market, right? So, you know, when the SEC, when you talk about principle-based regulation, what's the purpose of a market in the first place, right? It, I, in its most simplest, it's about capital formation, enabling the capital formation process, and providing a safe and efficient venue where people can exchange those shares, right? So anything that doesn't look like that should, I think, be questioned. So if, if, if there is somebody who can get to a price faster than somebody else because they can pay a higher price. Is that inherently is that helping the market structure? So I Greg, so I'd like to I'd I just, like I, I just want to have Greg because I know he's, yeah. he's he's tried to chime in it's, once or twice. So I just I, I think the question of um, of speed again just going back I'd like to reiterate the point I don't think speed is something we're striving for and in fact I think there are there is some there should be some guiding market forces that determine how fast is fast enough uh, you know I think that. Ideally, that's something the market decides rather than having a, a regulator decide. It's really 
300 microseconds or 3 milliseconds or 5 milliseconds, that there's some efficient price at which paying the extra uh, amount for a special network or this or that um, is no longer valuable enough. Um, all of this, I think, has to be subject to some safety and soundness uh, elements, which you know we talked about limit up, limit down. The SEC has regulation SCI in the works. All of this, I think, um, because you know you, you're, you can only at 60 hertz, you can only see the screen so many times per second. These are all happening at a pace that we need to make sure there are appropriate belts and suspenders around. All right, uh, we're nearing towards the end, so I'm going to allow uh, maybe one or two questions uh, uh, from the audience. Uh, and I see a gentleman here, if we can get a, a microphone. But, and, and in the interim, uh, as we move the microphone over, uh, certainly the, oh, well, you're already there. He's, you can raise your hand. There you go. And identify yourself. Uh, my name is Odney DePaulo. Um, I am surprised that you've only, in terms of TD Ameritrade, only received such a small number of calls. I just don't, I wonder if the information has just gotten out there enough. But one of the things that I'm hearing from people is the concern. They don't understand this. They don't understand what's happened exactly, but they have some bit of information that it, it's not all good. Granted, the market has improved over the last 10 years, five years, they're getting they're much better than they were, but something is happening right now to them, and one of the, the things that indicates that to them is that Schwab or some of these others are selling their order flow mm -hmm. to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars, and it's obviously valuable information that allows the high-frequency traders or others who are paying for that order flow to perform their arbitrage, which is to the detriment of the retail investor. And that's not being discussed. Oh, let me just back up. So I, I object to the term we sell our order flow. Uh, that's in the book. Uh, I don't agree with that phrase. Uh, so I should be clear how our order flow, or our order routing works. First, every client on every trade has choice. They can choose a venue at any time they want to execute a trade. So we give choice first, and they're informed of that choice. Number two, our, then we then go into, we move to multiple market centers for a variety of reasons. First is going to be about risk management. It's going to be about uh, best execution. It's going to be about being there in good times and in bad. It's going to be about financial stability, resiliency, and reputation. And all those venues basically you know, we go to for a variety of reasons, but you know, we want multiple venues and competition because basically there is incidents, we haven't talked about technology resiliency in the industry, but you know, you can have an incident where one of those venues goes down. Our risk management is to pick good vendors, but then assume one fails. Because we've seen it too many times, that, you know, people say right away, you have to be able to move your customer's orders literally within seconds. So that's the second reason, the second thing that goes into it. Third is best execution as defined in between the MBBO and there's, there's clear rules on that and you have to follow those and we get price improvement 90% of the time. Now how do we do that? Because of all those venues that we route to and you can ask the guys that deal with us on the stage, it's not always fun because we track your best execution daily. And if you're running off course, you get a phone call and you either rectify it or you can ask them, they're going to, they're going to lose some of our flow. Lastly, the very last thing, just like any other firm on the street, we seek to minimize our transaction costs. And in some cases, that means a revenue share agreement because people obviously want to interact with our flow. That's one of the reasons why commissions have come down because basically the industry has been doing that. And by the way, you know, the, the you know, payment for order flow per trade has come way in with decimalization. It's come way in. And, um, and so, you know, like, we, we do it all, we do, in our view of the world, we basically do the, exactly the same thing that anybody who's putting a lot of trades through it. You're trying to minimize costs or, or maximize um, you know, your revenue share. And that's going to happen under any market structure. Economically, you know, I'm, you know, that's my job is to make sure 
that after I've looked after my best execution responsibilities, that I'm getting the lowest cost execution for the flow that we have in the street. And in any competitive market structure, our flow has value. And, uh, and you know, we you will know, we'll always look to, to uh, maximize that. But after and only after we, uh, and we, get our, we look after our best execution responsibilities, but we do not sell our order flow. Okay, with that, unfortunately, we don't have any more time, but obviously many of you will have some questions after the session. I want to thank our panelists again. Uh, I certainly learned a lot, and I'm sure our uh, audience has as well. Thank you. Thank you.